Hello. Okay. Um, the next talk is uh, held by Anne Mittal. Uh, she's an open source enthusiast working for a startup in India and involved with KDE since 2014. Yeah. And today she will talk about how containerization and sandboxing can help with development. Yeah. Thank you for the intro. Yeah. So uh, I would li like to ask uh, everybody, how many of you know about containerization? Okay, about uh, virtual machines. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, let us start with what uh, uh, introducing myself. I started contributing KD as a uh, season of KD student in 2014. Got an opportunity to do this uh, GSOG in 2016, and currently working at Zomato, an Indian startup company. So, uh, what are we going to cover in this complete presentation? One. Why should we containerize things, the software that we build? Uh, what is containerization? How can we containerize our software? And what are the different ways through which we can uh, you know, build those images and all? So the first thing is why. As you know, uh, with each development phase, we have different tasks to do. And the timelines and deadlines are such that we have to you know, mess around sometimes. And we are not sure about if we can uh, do the complete staging process, the production uh, setting tests and everything. So uh, for to come up with a piece of the fast training technology landscape, it's uh, important that we uh, turn our face towards the containerization. Uh, before, we used to have a whole big bunch of packages and uh, have only one software that could do all our tasks together. But now, with the introduction of microservices, uh, we break down one, uh, our software into small tasks. For example, if uh, I am working for a restaurant APIs, I want something to uh, tell me what are the menus for the restaurants or similarly, different tasks. Uh, I break my complete project into small tasks. So now this requires uh, breaking down of a software into smaller requires uh, setting up uh, multiple tests for each of those cases. Before we were testing only for one complete project. Now, because we have divided into several parts, you have to take care of all the dependencies and libraries that are used in the microservices. So it amplifies our uh, requirement of uh, the work we do. So why should we know about containerization? Why? Uh, so the main reason is it's useful in every field that we work with. For developers, it's easy that uh, you it's b easy to get started with any project that, that you want to work on. You have a single link to it. We'll discuss more about it. The link is known as image of the uh, images. So it's just that image, uh, that link away that you can download the software. You can explore around the stuff. You can do versioning in it and a lot of many things that we're going to cover later on. Next. For IT operations, for example, if I have done my uh, uh, setup in my laptop, I give it to the production. I ask them, now it's upon you. Uh, we can exp uh, you know, give it to everybody to experiment. So what happens is, say, it works on my computer, but I'm not sure what is missing in yours. Or the person have to manually see what are the dependencies, what are the settings in my uh, uh, system right now. And uh, it was a lot of work for them. But then, by using the images that we create, uh, by, uh, that is created by the developer, the ID person doesn't have to work about the dependencies that the software requires. It's it's as simple for him also just to uh, you know uh, run the image in a container and do perform all the operation that they have to. Also, the last thing is about the business that we get from the uh, software that we're working. How to uh, analyze what was the past version's uh, success, what could be added in the future and stuff. So uh, through containerization, it's very easy to uh, uh, versionize your docu uh, software and to know what was the uh, level of success of each of the version. So it saves you from this thing that now my it, it's running on my computer. I don't know about what else is missing on somebody else's laptop. So you can just be spared from such situation when you use containers. Uh, next is what do you mean by containerization? Uh, containerization provi helps you create, deploy, and run your application 
using uh, containers. So, so as I told, there is this image link and there is this container on which we run these images. So um, you can easily uh, do whatever work you want to do, whether you just want to run it on a staging level, what, whether you want to run it on uh, for production uh, level stage. So it's easy to mock your environments and change settings according to the things that you want to do. Uh, so let's talk about what is an image and container. These are the two basic terms that you should be knowing when you start learning about containerization. So image is a package or a bundle of all these uh, things. For example, uh, it includes your code, your runtime settings, your libraries, environment variables, configuration file, uh, which we can say it's like manifest file, and uh, data if needed. So, uh, and when this image uh, gets in memory, for example, uh, when it comes into a runtime instance, it makes the container. So container is nothing without an image. Uh, we can understand it better by taking an example of a class and an object. Uh, what do we say class is? Class has all the functional method that uh, define itself, but it has no meaning until unless we create an object and initialize it. It doesn't work at all. So similar is uh, container. Container is your class. For container to run, you need images, which is which acts like your objects. Yeah. So, uh, what is containerization? In uh, container, in short, we can say it provides you an isolated environment. Uh, for if suppose, uh, I mean, yeah. So, if uh, you need some sort of binaries and libraries for a process A and different so set of libraries for set B. It gives you a uh, gives your package A a feeling that it is the only thing running and it has all the uh, version that it needs. For example, if you need a Python three for one process A and a Python three point one or some other version for any process B, when process E is running, it gets a sandbox environment in which it it is not affected by what other threads are going on, what other processes are going on in the system. So this is uh, how a container looks like. You everything is hosted on your uh, actual host OS. We have a container there. For example, in Docker, we the container engine is your Docker itself, and this container helps your applications to get its own um, isolated OS sort of thing. It is actually running on your uh, Host uh, host OS, but it gives the feeling that it has its own virtual thing. So now, would say, uh, what is the difference between a virtual machine and a container? So let us understand this thing by simple example. The container is running on your uh, running the process on your host OS, but in a virtual environment. Uh, sorry, in a sandbox environment. It doesn't have to have any um, external hardware support. For example, uh, in a VM, we need a hypervisor. So what it does is it, it maps your host OS into sm uh, small chunks, and each of the process has its own guest OS, and it, uh, in upon which it runs all the uh, dependencies. Whereas container is very lightweight because it doesn't have to uh, you know divide your actual OS into multiple parts, and you can run thousands of it together. Um, also, one thing that it works on is uh, known as G G groups. What is uh, G group? It gives you isolation, uh, process isolation, network isolation, or some different side, which are going to cover it later on. So, how does this uh, isolation happens? First, we would uh, we can understand it through an example of a uh, Linux kernel. For uh, initially, when we start our setup, uh, our uh, system, it has only one process ID which knows what further it has to uh, start so that your complete system is working. So it's a, a tree sort of structure where your one process ID gives uh, you know, initialization to the other two tasks, for example, ta process two and process three. This is a, a tree of processes that runs in your kernel. So if suppose uh, later on I want a container, I want to run my project in a different environment itself, what I do, I create a small child PID for myself. Now it has its own process IDs one, two, and three. 
but as it is sharing its uh, sharing the os with my actual system the os also have the 8 9 and 10 added along with it so uh, for the child it, it feels that it, i only have three processes in it but the uh, com, uh, the system knows that there are all together 10 processes that are running in your system similar uh, similar is the case with the file uh, isolation when uh, any child uh, uh, file is added to your system it creates a virtual disk for it but it won't be mapped with your actual hard disk until then unless you mount your virtual uh, child uh, process uh, your file to the actual global uh, mount namespace and also same is the case with the network isolation for example if you if you are, you have two processes which have different iso, uh, network interfaces it would create its own small subclasses and give it the feeling that it it is isolated from the rest of the process that is running on your laptop so what are the various ways of doing this uh, containerization one is docker and the other one is flat pack uh, we would cover some of the instructions how we can get started with uh, docker and flatpak and later on we will continue with the uh, demonstration of seeing how kd has uh, you know worked on uh, started working uh, using docker for a neon kd and uh, and flatpak we have some application for example uh, ocular and stuff so we'll run it uh, run uh, in the demo and show you this so what are the steps for installing it uh, so uh, this is the uh, steps that you have to follow to install docker uh, ce that is the community edition you simply have to do apt get update uh, followed by three other commands that are you know global uh, same for every uh, setup of linux so uh, after that once you are ready with the docker you have to set up the uh, repositories that you will be needed for example if you want to run a simple hello world uh, file you just have to do uh, install do docker ce then you have to run docker run the file name it can be any file name that you want to run this is this this sim simple command and you'll be getting a different container with the image that you wanted to uh, populate in it so hello world here is an image for example um so along with this uh, apart from this thing when as a developer when i'm ready with my image if suppose i've created my software it's in a shippable format um, i'll create a manifest of it which will uh, which is known as a image it, it will have every single thing that we mentioned about that image should have it will have the code it will have what all the dependent runtime dependencies we need and stuff so now how how do we do it for example in git we have this github where we push our code and anybody can fork it and can clone it and stuff similarly for docker we have a docker hub so all around the globe anybody who is uh, you know working on any stuff can upload an image link for it you just have to get uh, the uh, yeah just have to type docker run that image name now uh, what is flatpak a uh, flatpak is tied to linux i would say for example you can install a uh, softwares that are not uh, you know easily available for your linux environment because there are different uh, uh, domains we would say that we have ubuntu we have uh, dis uh, different distributions like uh, kubuntu ubuntu and flora uh, florida and stuff so what we can do is uh, we can use flatpak for uh, flatpak for such cases it focuses on building sandbox for your application uh, desktop applications whatever you want to have so we we are going to see this with example now what are the steps to uh, set up your flat pack uh, it is very similar to that we have a repository we just have to uh, uh, install it and afterwards it similar to the github similar to the uh, docker hub we have a fl uh, flat pack hub where we uh, upload all our images or the package ids so um in flatpak we have this package ids not exactly we would say image it, it is known as a flatpak ids so uh, how is it different from docker so docker has its uh, it is more related to providing uh, containers to it whereas this is fo more uh, focused on linux software that you want to run so now uh, i we have shubham along with us is going to help us run all this uh, demonstration for us
uh, anybody has any more question about images, containers, or flat pack and Downloading some Docker. What about the security impacts by downloading Docker images from somewhere? And the, what about the life cycle? So uh, basically, uh, what Docker provides you is, let's say you want to download a image for Python, but you're not sure what is the official source for it, right? So with Docker, what you can do is, So what this will give you is a list of images that are on uh, Docker Hub. And what are like different stars uh, that this particular image has. So in this particular case, uh, there are official images. So for Python, there is a mark there that this is an official image by uh, 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 the distributor, which is the Python organization over here. And then you also have the number of stars. Just like GitHub, you have stars on different depots. But yes, if you download an image that you don't trust and you give it access to your own uh, like mount space, which is your own hard disk, then it can do anything that is programmed into it. That is correct. But then uh, you usually try to not give your, uh, like you usually try to not volume mount your own OS or you only volume mount a specific uh, directory. So that way it cannot access a lot of stuff because it is sandboxed in an environment. So if you don't volume mount anything, uh, if you don't give it access to your original network, it won't be able to do anything. So, so, uh, in, so let's say we want to run. Uh, Sorry, just a short question uh, to make it complete. With uh, you, you, you show the flat pack and the Docker in contrast to virtualization. For virtualization, we have a hypervisor. We have support by the hardware to to get to get give this kind of security. Is the security on Docker and flat pack basically uh, the security of change root environment? The security of what is the Um, so Flatpak also provides you a sandbox environment, and what basically Flatpak does is they are more integrated uh, to Linux, and they are focused on Linux. That is what they want to do. Docker is more generalized, so it, it is for running APIs, applications, anything uh, like server related. They are more focused on desktop environment. What Flatpak provides you is they provide you like these different permissions that uh, in your manifest file you can mention that I need access to Dbus, I need access to X11 all of these display drivers. And in, before installing any image, it will ask you whether you want to give this permission or not. So let's say this is a new system, and I don't have Python installed on it. And I don't want to set up anything related to Python on my system. right? So what Docker provides you is you can download an official image. You only have to download a file. Uh, and that will give you the entire uh, libraries and everything else related to it. So I can do docker pull so but uh, what this will basically do is it will download an image for me uh, let's see uh, let we'll run one of the images that is already downloaded on this particular system so in this case I have an image for Swift downloaded. So I can do docker run hyphen it. Hyphen it is flag for basically uh, whatever process I'm going to run, I need it to be connected to my TTY. That's about it. So then you specify the image name, which is Swift, and you can specify the version or the tag of that image. So in this case, the tag is latest. So what this has done is it has started a shell in a sandbox, in a con it has started a container uh, using the files from that image, and uh, it has given me shell access to that particular container. I can do anything in this container, and when I uh, basically exit from this particular container, everything that I write will be lost unless I have mounted my volumes or something. So for example, if I create a file called foobar, So I have a file in my root namespace.
Uh, sorry, I have created a directory called Fuba. What I'll do is I'll exit this particular shell. When I start this again, it will be a fresh environment. So it won't have anything like that. So let's say I try out Swift. Uh, I compile whatever I need to compile with it. I've used Swift and I'm like, I don't like Swift anymore. So what I can do is I can exit and then I can just do docker rm image Swift. And uh, essentially, uh, if this image is not running anywhere, it will say, I have successfully deleted this particular image. I tried out Swift. It didn't work out for me. I have deleted that particular image. I didn't have to install any dependencies related to it or anything related to it on my particular system. Everything is gone now. So uh, what uh, what is the problem with uh, Docker is, uh, Docker is not focused on uh, uh, desktop applications. So you have to work around it uh, to make it run for desktop applications like any KDE application. So there is this project called KDE, KDE Neon. <laughs> so what they are trying to do is essentially uh, they've created this wrapper around Docker and they mark all of, they, they do all the heavy lifting for you. So you have to essentially volume mount certain uh, sockets. So when you run, you have to volume mount uh, sockets and drivers and all of those files. It does that automatically for you. And then you can do neon uh, RB. Uh, so this is a Ruby file. Uh, you can just press enter. It will download a KDE neon image. It will start running that particular image. In this case, it started a blank window. But this is running in a container uh, spawned by Docker. Uh, so Flatpak is slightly different. So, uh, so uh, we had to do all of these setups. We had to like start another project uh, like KDE Neon uh, for setting up or uh, making Docker work for us. Right? Flatpak is focused on uh, desktop environments. So what they do is once you have Flatpak set up. You can do a uh, flatpak install flathub uh, org dot kde dot let's say ocular. So this is one of the package over there. So it's saying it's already installed on my particular system. What I can do is flatpak run uh, org dot kde dot ocular. So, but this has essentially started uh, Ocular on my system. It is running in a sandbox environment. If I, uh, if I could try like uh, whatever I need to do with it, I could open files in it. So, with Docker, you have to volume mount your actual hard disk, right? Uh, but uh, with Flatback, you don't have to do it. So, once I click on a particular file that is on my original OS, it that automatically grants it the permission to access those files. So, I can open anything from my system. So it will open all, the, all of those files. So Ocular is working properly. Now as a user, I have tried it. It didn't work out for me. So uh, I could just uh, similarly, just like I removed uh, Docker image, I can also remove Flatpak image. So if I say yes, it will uninstall Ocular from my system. What Flatpak also provides you is, uh, so there is this uh, different uh, runtimes and SDKs that you can have. Um, so in this particular case, I am running uh, Ocular that needs KDE platform version 5.11. But I am also running Telegram, which needs KDE platform version 5.9. So I have both of those runtimes and both of those SDKs installed on my system at the same time. So this also pro provides me to keep different versions of library depending on what I want to run. So uh, as a developer, this can give you that particular sandbox environment with whatever files you need for your application to run. Then you can create this image, push this image uh, on Flathub or any other like a repository. 
and you can share it with the world and they can just do flat hub run this particular package ID. That's how it makes uh, life easy for developers and for users. So, that's for this demo. Okay, thank you. Um, we are at the end of the time. Uh, but we have time for one or two sh short questions, if there are any, and short answers. Uh, the flat pack thing, does it launch and attach to a normal X11 session or is it somehow sandboxed out of that as well? Or yeah, it, it runs a uh, X11 session. And in your X11 session or in a different X11 session? Um, that I'm not sure about. Uh, how is the security life cycle of, of this? Is it like, I get the impression that um, Security is treated as somebody else's problem and not, and, and uh, is that correct or uh, how, if uh, an, an app has an access to X11, it can basically read things from other applications, you can inject keystrokes, you can do a lot of weird things. Uh, Martin Kasslin made a talk about that two years ago, uh, but this is not something that plugs that hole? So, uh, as far as I know, uh, you give it permission to access X11 and after that it has uh, access to your entire X11 system. So, it could theoretically, I think, do that. So, whenever you run this command, uh, flat pack, run some uh, your package ID, it first says what are the things that are missing and it's going to install for you. You have to give it a permission saying yes, that it's okay with me and then it starts uh, you know, downloading it for you. I just looked it up because I was asking for security myself. Uh, it looks like Flatpak actually uh, has the model, the security model that it runs as the user, and the user who starts the Flatpak inherits all its permissions to the Flatpak. This is different to Docker. Docker um, has a sandbox environment, it has more isolation, but within Docker typically the application itself has basically root permissions within the sandbox. So Flatpak depends on the privilege separation in the kernel, with which knows about users, but it has, if you run it as your own user, it has, can it do everything you, you can do yourself. And if you run it as a different user, you can't access, for example, X11 anymore. Okay, so thank you for the presentation, and I think uh, time for questions is afterwards.